start by saying one of the things that I like Wheaton is doing these days is pushing students to get beyond campus. Go elsewhere in the United States, go abroad. But I'm always a little bit amused about how much students actually know about their current context. So one of the exercises I do in some of my classes is I will ask students, draw me a concept map of Wheaton, Illinois. This is an exercise that urban planners, researchers, and others will use to sort of get what kind of ideas do people have about particular spaces. And so when I ask students to do this, they have usually a few features. They sort of put Wheaton College in the middle. They know there's railroad tracks just south of there. They can usually identify Roosevelt Road. And then there's two other things that they usually have. On one end, to the west, they have Target. <laughs> and on the other end, to the east, somewhere in Wheaton, Glen Ellen, I don't know exactly what town, they have Los Burritos. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about it. When you ask them what's in the middle, what else is in Wheaton, Illinois, I don't know, there's some houses, some churches, people live there. That's about it. So when you spend four years, for many of you at Wheaton College, I'd encourage you, explore a little bit, walk around, see what's going on. There's actually a lot of interesting things in Wheaton and some of their surrounding suburbs. So tonight, what I hope to contribute is to help us think about what does residential segregation, usually by race, when we're talking about this as sociologists, how does this play out in Wheaton and some of the nearby suburbs? Here's the argument I want to make. In the past, I would argue Wheaton as a suburb, compared to other Chicago suburbs in particular, was pretty progressive on issues of race. It was more diverse in its population, and it was pretty forward-thinking on some key issues. Today, that's not usually how you would characterize Wheaton, Illinois. When you ask people, what's Wheaton about? They think sort of white, wealthy, religious people, kind of stuffy. So the question here tonight is, what happened in the middle? How does it go from being a fairly diverse suburb compared to others? It's not, you know, we could argue about whether it's truly diverse in the first place. That's, save that for the question time. But what happens between being more diverse and say being less diverse? So let me give you some broader context. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. That I'm a sociologist. This is what you have to know about this stuff in the United States as a whole. So the larger things going on in our country. Why do we have such a nation where whites, blacks, Latinos, Asians, and other racial ethnic groups live in different places? The story usually begins late 1800s, early 1900s. Civil War ended. Uh, Black slaves were freed in the South, but in the early 1900s, you get a flood of these largely Southern black residents moving to the North. Jim Crow laws are being instituted in the South. There's not many opportunities for them in the South. They're moving to Northern cities like Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, looking for jobs. As they're moving to these cities, whites in these cities are not particularly thrilled with this. And so what tends to happen, and you can see this still in Chicago's neighborhood, they tended to limit where blacks could live to particular neighborhoods. So there's a part of Chicago called the Black Belt, basically the place where blacks would live. If you tried moving outside of that, you would pretty literally be met with violence. A number of fire bombings, mobs, uh, there's a number of these famous cases. After World War II, veterans are returning from World War II, we need more housing. The federal government starts spending more of its money in the suburbs, building highways, making mortgages more available to people. But this is largely meant for whites, not for blacks. So you get these famous cases in one of the prototypical suburbs of this era, Levittown on Long Island outside New York. They are selling homes for cheaper than what it was to rent an apartment in New York at this point. But blacks were not allowed to live there for over 10 years. Just were turned away at the door. And this is pretty common. Uh, some of the other groups in the United States, Latinos and Asians, are kind of caught in the middle. Asians, in particular, often suffer from some of the same deed restrictions, can't get mortgages, can't live in certain neighborhoods. Latinos are somewhere in the middle here as well. By the time you get to the 50s and 60s, most of these more formal ways of discriminating against people are outlawed. For various court cases, and then you get the uh, Civil Rights Act in the early 60s, and you get the Federal Housing Act in 1968. So how is it today that people are still living in different places? It's mostly economic today, is a typical argument. Who has more money? Who has more wealth? This is largely whites in the United States. If you don't have this money, you don't have this wealth, you can't buy into these nicer places. It's interesting to note, too, Martin Luther King Jr. at one point later in his career tried to fight against residential segregation in Chicago. He came to the city in 1966, moved on the west side. He was not successful. He led marches through white neighborhoods. He was stoned at one point, hit a rock in the side of his head. It took him months to get a meeting with Chicago's mayor. They met, 
Mayor, the old Mayor Daly had promised him some things. Nothing really happened after that point. He went home and nothing really changed. This leads to this argument in this book, which is still kind of the classic in the field. And I heard the author speak a few months ago. They are updating it with some more recent data. But published back in the late 1980s called American Apartheid. They argue, our fundamental argument is that residential segregation and its characteristic institutional form, the black ghetto, are the key structural factors responsible for the perpetuation of black poverty in the United States. They show pretty convincingly there's something unique in the United States about whites and blacks living together. It doesn't happen. Other racial and ethnic groups have some more mixing, but there's something very unique about whites and blacks. And they go so far as to call this apartheid. Then, if people are living in different places, this has huge effects on people's lives. What schools are you gonna kid, your kids going to go to? Who are you going to interact with as your neighbors? What churches are you going to go to? Who are you going to see when you go to local stores? Who's going to represent you as a politician? Do you have access to health care, food, all sorts of things? Where you live matters a lot for your life. And so if people are living in different places, and particularly non-white groups are living in more disadvantaged places, this is going to have a big effect on it. And just to show you what this looks like, here's the list of the top 10 white-black segregated cities in the United States. One thing to note on this list, you don't get to a southern or western city till number 10. Right? Typically we think this was happening in the south, this is actually a more northern phenomenon. People live in different places. Milwaukee's number one on this list. So here's what Milwaukee looks like. The green dots are blacks, blue dots are whites, red are Asian, orange are Hispanic. You can see there's pretty big differences in where people live in this region. And this has been going on for about 100 years now in Milwaukee. It probably isn't ending anytime soon. I can show you Latinos too, but we'll skip over that. So if we get to Wheaton here, this is sort of the backdrop of Wheaton, Illinois, a suburban community. As I'm sure David will say more about, Wheaton has this early streak of abolitionism. But it's interesting to know this wasn't limited to Wheaton. This was a county-wide phenomenon. The Republican Party is founded in 1856 in Wisconsin. Before you know it, by 1860, basically everybody who's holding office in DuPage County is Republican. And what it meant to be a Republican in the 1800s, uh, 1850s or at the beginning, was largely abolitionism. Wheaton and the surrounding communities, people are concerned about this, not just the college. And you find very quickly that Wheaton was one of the only Chicago suburbs that had any black residents at all. Now, we're not talking about a lot, but they had some. So in the 1870 census, you can find 13. In 1910, you can find 43. They were restricted to, I don't know how forcibly restricted, but they generally lived in a neighborhood that's sort of southeast of campus here. If you go to College Avenue train station, kind of cross the track southeast of there, that's the neighborhood they lived in. So where Second Baptist Church is located today, that's kind of the neighborhood. They came for jobs. There were some families who were garbage collectors, and then there were also some who came to work on the railroad. And people knew where this was in town. We sort of knew that was like the black part of town. But again, Wheaton was one of the only places that even had a black part of town. Most other suburbs wouldn't have been allowed to live there in the first place. <coughs> And you get to the 1960s here, so fast forward 70, 80 years, and you find that Wheaton has a very unusual period in the late 1960s where it's more progressive. Through a variety of reasons, you had five city council voters at the time, four city council members and a mayor, so you had five voters on everything. Until roughly the mid-1960s, it was always kind of a three to two conservative over progressive vote. In the late 60s, the, the mayor dies by a heart attack and they have to replace him. There's two candidates who run to replace him. One of them is the postmaster in town. He drops out of the race about a week or two before the election happens because he finally learns that Illinois law says you can't hold two civil office jobs at the same time. So he decides the postmaster job is better for him in the long run. And so this more progressive female candidate wins the mayor of the race. And she's got some new ideas. So they've got sort of this three-two advantage on the city council here. So they pass Illinois' first open housing law. Oak Park tends to claim this. You know, Oak Park is sort of seen as this diverse, open suburb. Wheaton was actually several months ahead of Oak Park in doing this. Then they go ahead, they submit an application to build some public housing in Wheaton. And they also put together a plan to build a denser downtown. 
So when they were describing this open housing or fair housing ordinance, here's what they wrote. This is a brochure they distributed to residents. They said, why is this necessary? Our community has in the past successfully absorbed my members of minority groups. The question now confronting us is the extent to which we are prepared to absorb larger numbers of non-white citizens and the manner in which we will accept them. Because there is an increasing desire by financially qualified Negroes to move into the, from the urban ghetto, and because an increasing number of non-whites are employed by suburban firms, such citizens will want to move to Wheaton and other suburbs in increasing numbers. <laughs> this is almost a preemptive move on the city of Wheaton's part to say, we think this is the trend. More non-whites are moving to the suburbs. They have good jobs. We've done this in the past. We've welcomed non-white residents. Let's do this again in the future. Then this comes along here. You may have asked yourself at some point, why are there these big concrete buildings in downtown Wheaton 20-story apartment buildings. This was part of the plan of the mayor and the city council at the time to make downtown Wheaton more dense. It's apartments, you've got some townhouse buildings there, you've got a parking garage across the street that's still there, and you can't quite see it, but it's just to the right across the traps there. That's where the downtown train station is today. This was sort of meant to mimic sort of big city downtown life. Again, life is changing, new people are moving in, this is what Wheaton's going to look like in the future. Well, as you might imagine, and you might have noticed that there's really no other buildings that look like this in downtown Wheaton after these, there was a pretty big fight over these. And this became the main issue in the next election cycle. So this mayoral candidate, some of the progressive candidates who got voted in sort of on the ballot here for this issue. And there's some public hearings about this, and they're very open on the two sides about what this is about. The conservatives say the city council is controlled by a vociferous minority interested in socialistic advancement. And another quote, this was from the mayoral candidate, Wheaton isn't necessarily suited to everybody's way of life. People in low-income housing units may not want to live in a dry town. You couldn't sell alcohol in Wheaton until about 1985. So you can sort of read between the lines, right? There's some implications of who moves into apartment buildings, who are these new people we're welcoming. And the progressives say, their mayoral candidate says, I'd like to go back too, but we can't. We believe the times are with us. They are swirling about us, and we must participate. We can't build a city with a wall around it. This is the primary issue in this election cycle, and the conservatives win handily. Not even really a contest here when the voters go to the poll. First thing that this new uh, sort of city council does is they revoke that public housing application that we had put forward. It asked for 150 units of public housing. 100 of it was to be senior housing, which is always a concern in a community like Wheaton. What are older residents going to do when they can't stay in their homes anymore, when their houses have become too expensive? And the mayor says lower income housing in Wheaton can be handled without federal help by local church groups and social agencies like Hope, which was a fair housing group. You want to ask me later the, the story of religious groups being involved in housing and some of these issues? That's another piece of this, and it's interesting here. Second thing that they do is this new city council is try to get those apartment buildings stopped. But the permits have gone too far, the process is already along, the money's already been spent, so the apartments get filled. But after this point, you don't see any kind of dense housing <coughs> like that again. Sort of large scale. If you were to take a zoning map of Wheaton here, this is what you'd find on the City of Wheaton website. Everything that's in yellow, orange, and tan is housing. And you can just get, with a quick glance here, you can see Wheaton is largely a single family home or residential community. You have some areas, you can see downtowns in the middle with the kind of the purple and magenta areas. The light blue are all institutional, so you can see Wheaton College there, the county. DuPage County complexes there on the west side, a number of churches, cemeteries, some other things. But we can sort of retain this character as a single family home community. At the time that this law or this ordinance was passed in 1967, 45% of all non whites in DuPage County lived in Wheaton. Again, we're not talking about very many. But most of them lived in Wheaton. By 1970, one third of all blacks in DuPage County lived in Wheaton. By 1980, one in seven. Today, it's less. And some of those figures are interesting to think about. Like in 1970, there's 1,600 black residents total in DuPage County. 
DuPage County at that point has about 550, 600,000 people. Those are really small figures, but again, Wheaton was one of the only places that hit. But then the numbers kind of drop off. When you talk to people in Wheaton today, and this was part of my research, was interviewing leaders like mayors, former mayors, city council members, city managers, and so on about Wheaton and some of the nearby suburbs, they tend to describe it as evangelical, Christian, or conservative. And these are interesting to mix. It's partly religious, it's partly political. That's another story. A lot of them still mention that Wheaton was a dry town, even though this was 40 years ago. No, 30 years ago now that this was rescinded. This is the memory of a lot of people that you couldn't go to Wheaton to enjoy alcohol. And that it's stuffy. Other uh, suburban leaders will talk about diversity in their community. Wheaton actually has a good amount of religious diversity. It's seen as an evangelical center, but you know, the largest religious group in DuPage County is Catholics, by a lot. Mm. Wheaton has a strong Catholic presence, St. Michael Church, 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 some other parishes, and the, there's the national headquarters of the Theosophical Society, there's even a new mosque in town. But you don't generally hear Wheaton's leaders or residents who are talking about this kind and it's interesting to note, too, over the last couple decades, a number of these leaders and residents noted that even the evangelical presidents has kind of dwindled. Part of it is because more people moved in, so Wheaton's grown in size. And part of it is some of those Christian organizations have left for places like Colorado Springs and Junior Pastures. So if you were to look at it today, I've got Wheaton, I've got Naperville, West Chicago, DuPage County, and then the U.S. stuff there, you see some pretty big differences. In Wheaton, it's about 84% of residents identified white, white alone. 73% Naperville, 40% West Chicago, 68% New York County, 63% in the US. Um, Wheaton's black population isn't too different than Naperville or New York County. The Asian population is lower than Naperville and New York County, but it's pretty average in the country. Definitely lower on Latino. Uh, not too different on foreign born from the whole country. Wheaton's not the wealthiest suburb. There are much wealthier suburbs actually in the Chicago area. But it does have a fairly low poverty rate, 6.8% compared to the national average of 15.4. So just as a quick comparison in a few minutes, right? Not all suburbs look like this. When you walk outside Wheaton's boundaries, here are the college's boundaries, you don't have to go very far to find communities that are really different. So one of these would be West Chicago. If you went five miles west of here, take the train, two stops, the Winfield and then West Chicago for a drive, you can actually ride your bike on the prairie path that goes there too. It's a different kind of town, built around the railroad, much more about manufacturing, and it has a large Latino presence. If you were to look at Latinos in DuPage County, this is data from 2000. You can see a cluster there on the left side. That's West Chicago. This is Latinos by census tract. So you have some places in West Chicago that are 16 to 75% Latino. And you get some other clusters on the top right that's kind of up by O'Hare Airport, Addison, Bensonville, Elk Grove Village, some other places. We would be roughly right where the D and the U are in DuPage in the middle of America. Not many, but they're not alone. Naperville doesn't have very many to south, south of there, the southeastern part of the county doesn't either. But West Chicago is, say, only 40% white. They've wrestled with a lot of issues here. How do we do bilingual education in schools? Do we make English an official language? Do we hold things like a Mexican Independence Day? But in the end, when you talk to leaders, both Latino and white in the community, they tend to talk about this is a good thing in the long run. It's good that we get to know about each other. We're learning here. We're working these things out. We're not a place like Wheaton that's wealthy, but we're working on it. If you go to Naperville, this is a city south here of Wheaton, about five miles. Much bigger, 140,000 people, and wealthier, too. You talk to them here, they will tell you over and over again. Naperville is diverse. It's only about 73% white now. Large Asian population, a number of mosques. It's also wealthy, which I think changes some interesting things. It sort of hints at some of the issues here of race in the suburbs are hard to disentangle from issues of class. What you'll often find people in Naperville and Wheaton and some other places talking about is we accept non-white people if they act like middle and upper class white people. <laughs> but I've had quotes, I've had leaders tell me things like, you know, I've got an Indian neighbor here, but he keeps my, his yard nicer than mine, so we're okay with it, <laughs> essentially. Right? Or if uh, immigrants are moving to our community and they don't, aren't using disproportionate amounts of the police resources in our town, that's good. We have no problem with that. 
something like that. Right? What you find, though, is you look back into Naperville's history, there's good evidence that Naperville was a sundown town. One of these places in the United States where if you were non-white and it got to be dark at night, you were basically told in no uncertain terms you have to leave. Or something's going to happen to you. One of the researchers, Sir James Lewin, who's a sociologist who uh, first wrote the book Lies My Teacher Told Me, which is a great look at how American history is often taught. He's got another book on how American monuments whitewash a lot of these issues of race and so on. This one on sundown towns, he lists nature is one of these places. He actually suggests more than half of northern communities, cities, villages, towns, were sundown places. Again, most of us think, well, the north was the better place for race. Not necessarily. Some of the evidence I found here, there's minutes from the city council meeting, a commissioner saying, I remember when a certain minority had to be out of town at sundown. I remember when they couldn't participate in our beach, when they couldn't go in and get a haircut. They were actually banned from the city pool until 1960, until a federal law. A student at North Central College was doing an interview with one of the residents, and the resident said blacks could be in town during the day, but the minute they got dusk, they better get out. I think roughly until the 1970s, 1980s, the neighborhood was about 98, 99% white. But since then, something's changed there, right? They're only 73% white. So what you have here is you've got a lot of paradoxes in suburban communities. There's lots of jobs, there's lots of housing, we still have this ideology often in the United States, the place where you go that's best for your kids and your family is the suburbs. But the housing tends to be pretty expensive. You need a car, a lot of these jobs that are in the suburb, you know, like say working at a like, cashier at Target or working in the service industry or social services, they don't pay very well. Support networks are difficult to come by. There are still, I can give you a number of cases of housing discrimination that take place in these communities where landlords discriminate quite openly against non-whites. There's lots of stuff going on in places that we can, not everyone can access them still in the same ways. I will note in here that suburbs are actually getting more diverse than people think. Sociologists and others have noted this sort of 1950s image of white suburbia with a nuclear family and their single family home has changed quite a bit. Some of the evidence suggests about four out of every ten new immigrants in the United States moves directly to the suburbs. Our old model suggests that they would go live in an ethnic enclave in the big city like Chicago, you know, a Chinatown, a little Sicily, a little Italy, something like that, and then they move, their kids would move in the suburbs. That's not the case. Most of them, are, Many of them are moving directly to places like Naperville or Chicago. There are actually now more people in poverty in suburbs than there are in big cities, in terms of absolute numbers. And most suburbs are very ill-equipped to deal with people in poverty. People are more spread out geographically dispersed. They've never accounted for this in the budget before. This is a new issue. We've always had some wealthy and working class suburbs side by side, so there's always been a presence of that. And you can also find numerous suburbs, particularly closer to Chicago, but some further out as well, that experience the sort of big city problems that we think are isolated in big cities, but are now common, frankly, across many American communities, not just isolated to urban issues. And what we're finding, even with this increasing diversity in the suburbs, this residential segregation, this clustering by race and ethnicity, appears to be a very similar process and pattern to what we saw in cities over the last hundred years. Suburbs may look like the land of opportunity, but it appears most of the time we're just reproducing some of the same issues over and over.